After the Sabbath, at dawn on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went to look at the tomb. There was a violent earthquake, for an angel of the Lord came down from heaven and going to the tomb, rolled back the stone and sat on it. His appearance was like lightning, and his clothes were white as snow. The guards were so afraid of him, they shook and became like dead men. <laughs> the angel said to the women, Do not be afraid, for I know that you are looking for Jesus, who was crucified. He is not here. He has risen, just as he said. Come and see the place where he lay. Then go quickly and tell his disciples, He has risen from the dead and is going ahead of you into Galilee. There you will see him. Now I have told you. So the women hurried away from the tomb, afraid, yet filled with joy, and ran to tell his disciples. Suddenly, Jesus met them. Greetings, he said. They came to him, clasped his feet, and worshipped him. Then Jesus said to them, Do not be afraid. Go and tell my brothers to go to Galilee. There they will see me. again a great privilege to greet you in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ and to declare that one more time that he is risen praise his wonderful name it is good to be in God's house I'm grateful to see all of you here this morning I'm Richard Berger the pastor of the church and it is uh, great to uh, to have you all here it's amazing how life goes on even uh, as you're getting ready to celebrate uh, the biggest day of the year and so uh, other things are listed in the bulletin and just encourage you to uh, participate in, in all that you can. That is, uh, again, good to greet you in the name of the Lord. And let's stand together, shall we? And uh, as we get ready to sing and praise his name, let us, uh, let us look to the Lord in prayer. Again, Lord, we thank you today for the privilege that we have of celebrating the risen Jesus Christ. Lord, we come, that's, that's why we are here today, and we come to honor you and to worship you. And as the, the, uh, the women discovered uh, uh, so many, many years ago, that truly your presence in our lives is a source of great joy. And Father, we pray that today you would help us to uh, experience not only the joy, but the reality and the power of Jesus Christ. In his name we pray. Amen. Amen. Remain standing, please. Christ the Lord is risen today. Hallelujah. Sons of men and angels say. Hallelujah! Lives again our glorious King. Hallelujah! 
bow for prayer, shall we? Again, O oh Lord, we come into your presence, and we are grateful and thankful for your loving kindness and mercy. We thank you for the Lord Jesus Christ. We thank you for the power of God that is at work in that, in that name. We thank you for the tremendous <coughs> revelation and the tremendous revolution that you bring within each one of our lives as we yield ourselves and as we bring ourselves to follow and to trust and to believe in Jesus Christ. Lord, we come today as your children. We come today as uh, seekers after meaning in life, seekers after um, something that is bigger than ourselves, seekers after someone who can even rescue us from the things that we have gotten ourselves into. Lord Jesus, we come to you today. You are that one. You are that one who will right the wrongs. You are that one that will restore the relationships. You are the one that will, uh, that will bring life where there has been death. And we praise and thank you for that today. Lord, we think about uh, all around the world, how many millions and millions and millions have come together 
amid, uh, amid shouts of praise, amid uh, in, in great cathedrals, in small um, buildings, or even out of doors. And they have come together to celebrate the name of Jesus and to know that he lives once again. And sometimes we are, we are forced to ask ourselves the question, why is that so important? It's so important because of so many different things. But primarily it is important that you, Jesus, the author of life, are the King of kings, the Lord of lords. And that there will come a day, there will come a moment when every knee shall bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord above all. And we look forward to that day, Lord. We look forward to be able to repeat to you what we have said in our lives, in our hearts, all of our life. And Lord, we thank you for that privilege and for that opportunity. Pray for your people today that are sick, whether in this congregation or, or uh, and friends and neighbors. Lord, we think of the, of the families uh, out in the Sherrard area that are grieving today because of the loss of loved ones in a, in a serious tragedy. And Lord, we pray that you would comfort those families and that you'd help them as only you can as they, as they experience their grief and their need and their heartache. Lord, we come to you today and we pray for your healing hand to be upon people. We pray, Lord, that you would bring healing for, for diseases. We pray that you would bring healing for relationships, that you would bring healing for struggles and problems and addictions. We pray, God, today that you indeed would bring healing. And we praise you and thank you for all that you are, are doing in, in our behalf. And Lord, we surrender ourselves to you this day. We give ourselves to you and ask that, uh, that as we are here this morning, that the voice of your Holy Spirit would speak into our hearts and into our lives and into our spiritual ears and, and remind us of your great love and power and goodness. And Lord, today as we give unto you our tithes and offerings, as we give our, our Easter offering today, for the, the cause and the work of, of your kingdom building around the world. We just thank you, Lord, for the privilege, the opportunity that we have of sharing with you and of returning to you some of what you have blessed us so abundantly with. And Lord, so often we're reminded that even in our, even in our want, even in our seemingly little that we have, we are wealthy um, in comparison to much of the rest of the world. And so, Lord, we are grateful to you today and give you thanks. Touch and help us, Lord, as we, as we give and as we continue to worship. In Jesus' name, amen. Please be seated.
Amen. Thank you, Becky. Thank you for your giving this morning. So I uh, posting on Facebook this week that grabbed my attention. In fact, many of you know the person who posted it. Mark Barnes had this as a status. The all-powerful resurrected Christ authenticates Calvary, enlivens the church, and guarantees his second coming. The all-powerful resurrected Christ and, uh, authenticates Calvary, enlivens the church, and guarantees his second coming. And as we have gathered together today in celebration of Christ's resurrection, that's a good reminder of what Jesus accomplished. All three of those things, plus, plus much more. But when he came out of that tomb on the first day of the week after the celebration of the Passover, we see a little bit of what he accomplished. Authenticating Calvary, enlivening the church, and guaranteeing that he is coming again. Every now and then I, uh, I play, uh, I won't call it a game, I guess, but maybe it is. Uh, every now and then I engage in a sort of what if. What if Jesus had not risen? Well, if Jesus had not risen, then Calvary is just another meaningless and cruel execution scene. It's all it is, is a crucifixion. All it is, is an execution. The church is a memorial society. A memorial society trying to keep the memory alive. And, uh, and, and, and part of it, as, I, as I think about this, I think about a, uh, uh, a high school basketball team of 50 years ago. Let's see, that would make it about 1963. Let's say the, the, the state championship team of 1963 get together every year so that they can relive that high school championship game and that last minute shot that won the title. And they meet and they talk and they remember and they sometimes will even try to get out on a basketball court and figure out what might be able to do. And they discover that they can't do it anymore. The church becomes a memorial society that sits around and says, hey, you remember the good old days? You know, one of the, th one of the things that, that, that really uh, troubles me the most many times is when organizations, and sometimes it is churches, will have big uh, celebrations, maybe an anniversary celebration or something of that nature, and all that they're able to talk about, all that they're able to think about is their, their heritage. A number of years ago, we had our 75th anniversary here at the church. And a lot of folks that came, uh, came that had grown up in the 30s and the 40s and, uh, and, and had been part of this congregation. And uh, they were all filled with all kinds of stories and all kinds of uh, ideas and thoughts. And, you know, they, but, but in talking to them, you, you almost got the impression that they were saying, you know what, those were the best days of the church. And you had to, tie, you had to bite your tongue not to say, you're crazy because you don't want to offend people that you invite to come uh, just, you know, once every 75 years. But, you know, it, it's, it's when, you, when you begin to, to look back and say, oh, that was the best time, and that was the best time, and that was the best time, then the church becomes a memorial society. But it's not a memorial society. It's a living, breathing organism. It's alive today as Jesus is. And also, when, when you think about it, when, when I engage in this sort of what if, if Jesus had not risen, then when we draw our last breath in this world, it literally is our last moment of existence, and there's no hope for anything else. Or the way I put it sometimes, you live, you die, you're done. And that's all there is. But in the words of the Apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians 15, 20, he says, But Christ indeed has been risen from the dead, the first fruits of those that have fallen asleep. So I want to think about this this morning. 
I want to think about how Christ's resurrection authenticates Calvary and how he enlivens the church and, and how his uh, resurrection is a guarantee of his return, of his coming again. You know, when you think about Calvary, you think about the scene of the cross as one of great suffering. The other night, uh, some of our teens gathered here at the church and watched uh, once again the Passion of the Christ. And, uh, and that's brutal. There's a reason why it's rated R. It's brutal. And sometimes people will maybe question, say, are people really, are, can people really be that, that mean and that awful and that terrible? And the short answer is yes. We see it from time to time in our news broadcasts. We read about it in the newspapers of some terrible uh, atrocity that has happened in someone's life. And so when we think about the cross, we think about every, every evil thing that could have been done. And there was a, there was a sense of physical torture, the exhaustion and the, and, and, and the, the, the loss of blood, the, uh, the uh, going without food and water for however many hours. It was a tremendous, tremendous, tremendous physical suffering and torture. There is an emotional and mental torture as well. I don't know about you, but sometimes when I just get hurt a little bit, I, I feel pretty bad. Not just physically, but you say, oh, well, why did that happen? When you think about the cross, the emotional and the mental suffering that Jesus experienced as he endured that cross, the taunts, the humiliation, the, the, the name-calling, the, the, the being uh, spat upon, and, the, and, the, and the, the beating, and the fists, and the little game of, hey, who hit you? They blindfolded him and said, oh, by the way, hey, who, who hit you? Who hit you? Can you tell? You're a prophet. But for Jesus, there's also the spiritual suffering. He knew what he was coming for. He knew what he was in for. He knew what was, he was going to be experiencing. And he went through it anyway. He knew that all heaven and hell would be out that day rooting for him. One rooting for his destruction and the other rooting for his faithfulness. All heaven and hell would be there that day in order to watch what was happening. But the resurrection of Jesus from the dead turns the cross from a, from a cruel instrument of torture into a symbol of salvation. You see, without the resurrection, Calvary is just so much suffering. But because Jesus rose from the dead, he's able to offer forgiveness and deliverance. And that's, that's what makes the difference. He's able, to, he's able to offer to you and me Contrary to what we have experienced, contrary to what has been our life, he is able to offer to you and me much more. Eternal life, hope, the future, everything that that's involved in. Now there are many expl explanations of how, uh, of how that all comes to be. Some look at, uh, at, at Calvary and they say, well, it was that, that Jesus' death turned away God's wrath from humanity. I mean, God was, was filled with wrath. I mean, mankind had, had, had slaughtered his name, and they had dragged down his name, and they had disobeyed him, and, and th th this righteous judge was, th th somebody had to pay. Not about you, but sometimes I feel that way. About things that happen. I just want somebody to pay for what happened. And so there's some that explain Jesus' death, that, that, that somehow God's, God's wrath was, was turned away when Jesus died and suffered on the cross, and somehow that was, that was to appease that. There's those that explain that Jesus, satisfied, Jesus' death satisfied, satisfied God's innate sense of justice. You know, there's a, there, there, is a, there is this line of, of what's right and what's wrong, and, and, and God stands at that line, and, and all the rest of us are over here, and so Jesus' death somehow satisfied God's sense of justice. Another way of explaining it is that, that when Jesus died on the cross, it was a way of redeeming us from sin, from slavery to sin. Jesus himself talks about 
about him coming to be a redemption, to offer redemption to people from the slavery of what they would be. Then there's another way of explaining it is that Jesus' suffering and death is the love of God expressed through God himself taking our place. Charles Wesley in his great, uh, his great hymn, And Can It Be, one of the climactic lines in that hymn is that thou, my God, shouldst die for me. Thou, my God, shouldst die for me. And so when we think about Calvary and we think about Jesus' resurrection and how it authenticates Calvary, it is more than just a scene of, of blood and gore. And that which was to be a, uh, a, a, a uh, symbol of, of evil, a symbol of punishment, a symbol of torture, becomes a symbol of salvation. Then the res resurrected Christ also enlivens the church. Think about the mood of the disciples prior to the resurrection. In Luke 24, we have uh, in, in the evening of, of, the, of Resurrection Day, there are two disciples who, who are decided to go home. They are leaving Jerusalem. They head for a little town called Emmaus. And, and as they are on the way, they are joined by a third person who walks along with them. And they are talking about the events of the day. And they are downcast. They are they are discouraged. The one in whom they had put all their hope, the one in whom they had put all their hope was dead. I don't know if you've ever experienced that or not. But the one that you were really hoping would come through didn't come through. And there was Mark 15, which is, uh, which is the... the, the talks about how the burial of Jesus. And I can just, I, I can just imagine and, and think about Joseph and Nicodemus and, and Mary, the mother of Jesus, and, and others who were there as they, as they lowered him from the cross and they wrapped his body up and they picked it up limp and lifeless and just nothing there. And took it to the cross. Took it to the tomb. How difficult that would be, how painful that would be on a number of different levels. And then there's, uh, <clears throat> there's also uh, in Luke 24, when, uh, when the disciples, uh, when the women had seen Jesus, and so they were, they were all excited, and they were coming back, and they were banging on the door where the disciples were holed up, and they burst in and they say, hey, we have seen Jesus, the tomb is empty, and he is alive. And their response was disbelief and nonsense. And then in John 20, we're reminded of how fearful they were. There was fear. What's going to happen to us now? What's going to happen to, to us? We, we walked away from our homes. Said, oh, we're walking with God's man. And now we've got to go back home and say, well, can I have a job fishing again? There's the, uh, the fear of what the authorities would do. They had seen what had happened to Jesus a couple of days prior to that. And there was that sense of, okay, is this going to happen to us? I mean, are we guilty by association? Are we guilty by association? You know, before he went to the cross, Jesus had a conversation with a lady by the name of Martha. In the 11th chapter of John, it, it talks about their Martha and Mary and their brother Lazarus, who were very, very close and good friends of Jesus. Well, Lazarus died. And so Jesus came along a few days later, and, and, uh, they were, and, and he and Martha were talking, and they said, he said, Martha, um, she said, first of all, she said, Lord, if you'd been here, he wouldn't have died. And even then, she was blaming Jesus. But his conversation with her was, Martha, do you, do you believe that I am the resurrection life? She says, I am. I do. And he said, well, I am. Trust me in this. And the conversation of the Passover when, in John chapter 14, when the disciples said, uh, 
uh, Jesus, show us the Father, and, 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 and we will be satisfied. It will, we'll, we'll be happy with that. And Jesus said, I am the way and the truth and the life. You know, every community has several preservation societies. We have several here in town, and, 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 um, and they are good. They, they seek to preserve some of the history of, of, the, uh, of the community, you know, the town, the founding fathers, and all that kind of stuff. But there's self-preservation society, or not a self-preservation society, is, 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 kind of, is kind of difficult and defeating because you know that somewhere along the line, what you're trying to preserve is going to just be destroyed. And it's going to be gone. It's kind of like uh, a group that would form and say, let's, let's keep the memory of, of Abraham Lincoln alive. And so they meet. And they read things that Lincoln wrote and said. And you can almost feel the presence of Lincoln in their meetings. But Lincoln is dead. Has been for a long time. But that's not what the church is. That's not what the church is all about. With the resurrection, we have a message. We have a story. We have a hope. The two, the two men that were on their way to Emmaus, and they came and they turned around and they, they ran back to Jerusalem, even though it was, it, was, it was dark and it was dangerous to do so. They came bursting in and said, hey, we have seen Jesus. And they said, well, yeah, well, some of the ladies said, came back and said they had seen Jesus. And we just thought they were crazy. No, no, we have seen Jesus. He says, whoa. Let's think about that. All through the Acts of the Apostles, their accounts of Jesus' activity through the Holy Spirit, directing the work, seemed good to the Holy Spirit that we do this and that. And as they began to, uh, you know, the, the, the revelation of Jesus to the Apostle Paul, nine, when, he, when he became a Christian, when he began to follow Jesus, it was all about Jesus being alive. Encounters with the resurrected Christ bring life even, even today. So think, think about some of the things that in 1 Corinthians 15 that Paul, some of the individuals and, <clears throat> and people that Paul spoke to, or spoke about rather, that Jesus had appeared to. And if Christ has not been raised, our preaching is useless, and, and so is your faith. Christ has been risen. And he said, for what I received, I passed on to you as the first importance that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures, that he appeared to Peter and then the twelve. After that, he appeared to more than 500 of the brothers at the same time, most of whom are still living, though some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles, and then he appeared to me. We see him at work in the transformation of people's lives. Not too long ago, I heard someone talk about how, how the, what, what Jesus had done in their life. They said they turned them from a, from a, from a, uh, a tired, angry, bitter person who was filled with nothing but themselves and turned them into one who says, you know what, I have, got, I have got more joy, and I have got more peace, and I have got more life in me than I have absolutely ever had in my entire life. See, that's what the living Jesus is able to do. A man by the name of Matt Chandler, I'm reading a book called The Explicit Gospel. And Matt Chandler talks about uh, how when he first came to Christ... He was in college, and he was full of all kinds of questions. Questions of faith, and question of understanding, and questions of, of, uh, of interpretation, and questions, and questions, and questions. And he said, all the questions I had suddenly did not need answers when I came to Jesus. I just knew. See, the church calls the world to a personal relationship of grace and faith in a living Christ. 
The church calls the world. There's, there's a little church in, a, in the jungle of, of, of Guatemala that is meeting there probably right now. That is in a very simple uh, village, in a very simple circumstance. It is the only church in that town. And it is, uh, and, and, and undoubtedly this morning, is, it, there, ha- there are, are numbers and numbers of people that have come together because of what Jesus has done in their lives. You see, we, are, we, are, we call the world to a personal relationship of grace and faith and a living Christ. And then finally, the, resurrection, uh, Christ, the resurrected Christ guarantees his second coming. Think about life without the resurrection. Um, and if Christ has not been raised, Paul writes, our preaching is useless and so is your faith. More than that, we are then found to be false witnesses about God. For we have testified about God that he raised Christ from the dead, but he did not raise him if, in fact, the dead are not raised. For if the dead are not raised, then Christ has not been raised either. And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile, you are still in your sins, then those also who have fallen asleep in Christ are lost. If only for this life we have hope in Christ, we are to be pitied more than all men. Paul says preachers, including, including myself, are liars. And I've been accused of that different times. But he says, if Christ is not raised from the dead, he says, everything I'm telling you is wrong. I've given my whole life to something that's, that's a fiction. And he says, if Jesus Christ is not risen from the dead, then you are still in your sins. And it's all meaningless. There's no, there's no hope. There's no goodness. He goes on to say that we might as well live only for the moment because when we die, that really is it. But Christ's resurrection foreshadows our own. Paul calls it in verse 20, he calls it the first fruits. The first fruits is just kind of the, kind of the, 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 the little bit that you bring and say there's a whole lot more where that came from. That's one of the uh, one of the offerings that the Jewish people gave was when they would uh, when they would begin the harvest they would take a little bit of it they would take it to the temple or to the synagogue or to the priest and offer it to God and say this is the first fruits there's a whole lot more out there when I was a kid on the farm we used to uh, we used to, when we started the wheat harvest or oat harvest or whatever it was, we would go make a couple of rounds around the field, and then we would take it to the, uh, then we we would take a, a can of it to the elevator, and they would test it for moisture so that we could find out whether it was you know dry enough to to harvest or whether we needed to wait for a day or two or something like that. And when I think about first fruits, I think about that. There's that there's that little there's that little can full of wheat that we got out of the wagon, and we're taking it to test it, knowing that there's a whole field full of it that's going to come be harvested yet Jesus calls it or Paul calls it the first fruits in John 14 the night before his crucified Jesus said I'm going to go and prepare a place for you and if I go and prepare a place for you I will come again and I will receive you to myself and Acts men of Galilee Why do you stand here looking into the sky? The same Jesus will come back. There are close proximity between his resurrection appearances and his ascension. When he he got to that point, he spent those little over a month, 40 days, whatever, with with his disciples. He said, said, this is, uh, and he began to to leave them. And they, they just stood there. Just stood there until a couple of angels appeared to him and said, Men of Galilee, wake up. This Jesus is going to come back the same way he left. And friends, that's the hope of our faith. Hebrews 9, 20, 28 is, is the, the second half of a verse that is very familiar. Hebrews 9.27 says, for, for it is appointed unto man once to die, and after that the judgment. And we all know that. A lot of people know that one. But they don't know what follows. It's kind of like when I was a kid, there, we used to buy 45 RPM records. They were about that long, had a big hole in the center of them. 
And on one side was the song that they really wanted to promote. Well, they had to do something with the other side, so they would put another song on that side. And so you got the, you got, you got, you got the more popular song, and then you got the other one. And sometimes, to surprising to all the record label makers, all the record makers, the side on the back side, the song on the back side would have more sales and would become more popular than the one they were trying to promote. Hebrews 9.28 is a little bit like that. Hebrews 9.28 says that, 9.27, in, in as much as it appointed one to man once to die, and after that the judgment. Hebrews 9.28 says, He, meaning Jesus, will appear a second time to bring salvation to those who are waiting for him. He will bring judgment and reward. He will bring honor for those who follow him. Honor. Those of us who have, who, who have spent our lives believing in Jesus against all odds, against people who have tried to ridicule our faith, against people who have tried to discourage us from our faith, against people who have tried to, to take us back to where we once were. There will be honor. There will be vindication. There will be something that says, you know what? I'm all... That was right. Joy for those who are in a service. There's going to be the glory of his uninterrupted presence. And John says, when we see him, we will see him. We will be like him, for we will see him as he is. You know, the resurrection of Jesus means many things. And one of the most important things is the victory of life over death. William Barclay tells the story of a, of a church during World War II in, in London. And it was in the fall of the year, and they were going to have a big harvest celebration the next day. And so it was all set up. There, was, there, were, there were vegetables, and there was fruit, and there was, there were some, sh some, uh, some ears of corn that were laying on the, on, the, uh, on the communion table, on the altar. Well, that night is when the, uh, when the air raids came, and that church was totally destroyed. The German bombs dropped on it, and it was totally destroyed. And it was left... And in, in, in rubble, not one stone practically standing on another. And so they began to, uh, and so as the winter went by, and, and uh, probably people came in and out to some degree, but as the spring began to come, the spring began to arrive, they noticed little shoots coming out of where that altar had once been. And then that, those shoots became little stalks, and those stalks grew up. And they just left them there. They just left them there and, and watched to see what would happen. And towards the fall of the year, you know what happened. There were ears of corn that had appeared. And, and, and out of that rubble, out of that destruction, out of that, out of that chaos, life had sprung. And that's a picture of many of our lives. Our lives might be described as rubble. Our lives might be described because of our own choices, because of circumstances, because of whatever. They might be nothing but what the world looks at and says, what a mess. What a mess. Who's going to clean that up? The one who brought life out of death is the one that can clean it up. In a world of decay, there's hope only in Jesus Christ. In a world that seems chaotic, in a world that seems out of control, in a world that seems like there is just nothing going right, there is Jesus the King of kings and the Lord of lords. And I pray and I trust that your hope and your life is in him today. When you came in this morning in the bulletin that you received, there was a, uh, there was a little beige colored card. Call that a connection card. In the front is address, name, and all the other kinds of things. Certainly we'd love to have that. But on the back side,
<clears throat> there are two boxes. One is for prayer requests, and the one on the left is the one I want to draw your attention to right now. Since the all-powerful resurrected Christ has validated Calvary and livened the church, and will soon be coming again, I'm responding to his call to believe in him alone for my salvation and eternal life. You cannot hear the gospel proclaimed and it not have any effect on you. It will either draw you closer to Jesus or it will harden you. And once we get to be hardened enough, we go deaf. But there's also the call of Jesus. That when we hear and we respond, we say, you know what? My life is a mess. I might as well try this. There's nothing else has worked. Or I, I, I remember. I remember what I once had, or once I, what I once believed, once I once, what I once knew. And I want that back again. So this morning, I want to give you a chance. Another opportunity to turn once again to the living Christ, to repent of sin and and begin an eternal journey. In just a moment, I'm going to pray and, and, uh, and just uh, allow you to spend some time with you, the Lord. So let's bow our heads, shall we? Father in heaven, we come to you today. And again, we thank you for Jesus. We thank you that we cannot find his grave anywhere. We thank you that there is no tomb that marks where he is because he is not there. He is risen. And so Lord, today I thank you for each one that has come into this sanctuary today. And it's kind of stuffy in here and, and it's kind of close and 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 Dinner's waiting somewhere. But Lord, we just want to take a few moments to once again offer the gospel, the good news of Jesus to those that are willing. And Father, I thank you today that Calvary is not just a gruesome execution scene but it is the symbol of repentance and forgiveness and second and third chances. I thank you, Lord, that the church is not just some organization that's trying to keep somebody's memory alive, but it is the people of God who have heard your call and have responded and said, I want to follow Jesus. And Lord, we thank you for the hope that we have for when you return. Jesus, that is our hope. You are our hope. And we thank you. And so Lord, today, I ask that you would, by your Holy Spirit, speak the message of Jesus into hearts and lives. And Lord, where there, is, where there is confusion, where there is perhaps bitterness, where there is ignorance, where there is sin, God, we repent and we turn away and we ask for your forgiveness. We ask you to come into our hearts Make us brand new. Change us. And we ask, O oh God, that you would help us to follow you. Not our own desires, not our own plans, not our own things, but that we would follow you. Until we meet up with you face to face. So Jesus, we thank you the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And Lord, I pray that this day 
there would be those who have said yes to Jesus and would say yes to you. In his name we pray. Amen. I'm going to ask the praise team to come and lead us in our closing song. And This morning, if that was your prayer, if that was the desire of your heart, I'll just ask you just to mark that little card when you turn it in, and we'll try to get back to you and not try. We will uh, give every, uh, every desire, every possibility to, to get back to you and try to help you and encourage you in this new, in, in this new life. Let's stand together, shall we? And again, I just want to thank you for being here today. And uh, it's going to be a beautiful day. Uh, and it already has been. So praise God. As, we, uh, as soon as we're done singing, we'll pronounce a benediction. And then you'll be on your way. But I would just encourage you to, to drop off that connection card. It's particularly if you have received Christ as your Savior today. And have made a new beginning and a new life. Amen. Let's sing together. I serve the risen Savior, He's in the world today. I know that He is living, whatever men may say. I see His hand of mercy, I hear His voice of cheer. And just the time I need Him, He's always near. He lives, He lives, He lives, Christ Jesus lives today. He walks with me and talks with me along life's narrow way. He lives, he lives, salvation to impart. You ask me how I know he lives. He lives within my heart. In all the world around me, I see his loving care. And all my heart is I know that he is leading through all the stormy blasts. The day of his appearing will come at last. He lives, he lives, he lives, Christ Jesus lives today. He walks with me and talks with me along my tear away. He lives, he lives, he lives, salvation to impart. You ask me how I know he lives, he lives within my heart. Rejoice, rejoice, O Christian, lift up your voice and sing eternal hallelujahs to Jesus Christ the King. The hope of all who seek him, the help of all who find. None other is so loving, so good and kind. He lives, he lives, he lives, Christ Jesus lives today. He walks with me and talks with me along my narrow way. He lives, he lives, he lives, salvation to impart. You ask me how I know. Amen. 1 Corinthians 15, 58. Therefore, my dear brothers, stand firm, let nothing move you. Always give yourselves fully to the work of the Lord, because you know that your labor in the Lord is not in vain. And everyone said? Amen. Amen. God bless you.